Let's start with the first one, Robert, variability. Tell me about the baseline of this topic. Yeah, well, Berto, good, good segue as we, we enter into this session, session two. You, again, the first session we did a few weeks ago was the prelude to where we are today. But variability, I think, is a very important uh, milestone to get our hands around in FATs. And really, what we want to talk about are the ingredients of an FAT. Uh, and then post FAT into operations. So we're talking about, you know, your people again. We're talking about the actual equipment. We're talking about specifications of the material and product, standards and procedures. And then a fourth nugget, which is very important, oftentimes missed, is called modes of operation. Um, and that's very, very important. So these are the key four building blocks as we go through today on uh, variability. We want to just dive into that a little bit. Yeah, on our first podcast, we touched base a little bit but about people. On this one, let's go a little bit more deep, okay? Because variability, one of the main objectives of this is how we measure the success or failure of the people, right? Exactly, yeah. So how, how, how we can express easy in our world, you know, that we can determine that a people is ready to proceed to execute FIT or not. What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, that's a very interesting point. So we're going to do both internal and external, right? Because that's part of the team here. And, uh, you know, being ready, I think you have to start with an assessment, right? So skill set assessment on uh, capabilities, technical and actual activities. So the activities that are going to be performed at the FAT, we want to make sure those are understood and, and you know, people are really well-rounded in understanding what they're going to do. And, and then, you know, having them understand where the, the risks are, the risk, and then the uh, solutions, at least bring that to the table to have a collaboration. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, an assessment is very, very important. Um, and then, you know, looking at the, you know, again, back again, skill level, um, you know, are they at, you know, the minimal level? Are they, uh, you know, experts or are they, you know, coach, you know, coaches? So to figure out kind of how you go after the FAT. So I think that's very important. And, and furthermore, external. So I, that was sort of an internal assessment. External is the same. That's kind of hard, hard to do because there you need a, a good relationship with your external supplier, your OEM, to really have them, you know, discuss you know, their internal uh, training and, and capability of the people conducting the FAT that they're going to have at their facility for us. Yeah. On our first podcast about this topic, we talk about a lot about the skill, uh, the importance of half a pre-FIT communication process, right, with them. On this one, I think that one of the also another way to take a measurement and quantify the knowledge of the people is that companies should allow to present this engineer the plan to a board, to a committee, or to the manager, or to the, to the operational uh, people. So they can prove that they are ready and they understand exactly what they need to look, do on that factory acceptance test. Do you think that this is something that the company should start to do, you know, like a preparation part, presentation mood before execute FIT? Yeah, I think, for, at the, you know, again, we talk about the, the journey of collaboration is, is, is continual. So I think that uh, the key is not just the presentation, but it's the content of what should be uh, in the FATs. For instance, if we talk about in the people side again, um, what do they know about the technical aspects of this FAT? Uh, whether it could be safety, whether it's, uh, I'm going to make up something here, uh, they're doing seal checks in the FAT, working with the quality team, you know, and they're packaging materials engineer, let's just use that person, you know, how do they, what's their skill level and talent or you know, a knowledge level relative to the equipment interface. Again, you know, material and equipment go hand in hand, right? So then you've got the quality team looking and saying, do we have the right seal integrity? You've got the material team saying we've got these characteristics. So each member 
provides these ingredients into the document. A document, again, we talked last time, whether it's electronic or hard copy, hopefully again electronic when we're doing it, to uh, unveil and, you know, that's knowledge sharing. So you're right, Wilberto, you have this knowledge sharing base. And in essence, you, you capture what's potentially missing and it gives us a chance to get the right brains around what should be in that content. And then most importantly, if it's internal as it, at the CPG, you can transfer that out externally to your supplier and get their input and have that engagement. You hit the ball really hard on that one, uh, Robert, because safety, quality, other departments. And for me, this is the key to be sure that the people are ready and the word is collaboration. If you prove to others that you are collaborating with other departments, that means that you are acquiring all the knowledge that you need or more to execute a successful factory acceptance test. So just you, boop, <laughs> it is really hard on that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. yeah but yeah, oftentimes, yeah. Wilberto, that's missed. The simple things are missed. And those are the things that impact the FATs the most. Yeah. But keep going. Good, good question there. But, but, but I, I, I think, you know, I think that at least to see that the people are trying to collaborate, we are reducing error and omissions. So we, you are, you, know. you are, it's been proven. Yeah, exactly. So below variability, let's go about to talk about equipment. So on this part, how to measure the test, you know, how, this is for me, and you can put your point. I believe that this is where the key communication with the OEM need to happen, and the OEM need to understand the needs of the customer. You hit it. That's a very good, <laughs> um, I guess, segue into my point here. You're right. That's uh, that's key. It's uh, so. Let's just take the 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 audience here. So you have mm -hmm. the the hiring company, let's just call a, a pharma company, mm -hmm. uh, and you have a, an OEM. So we, we would agree that the OEM is the expert on their equipment as far as the design, performance, um, its capabilities, its design capabilities, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, we would also say that the pharma companies are the experts on their product and their materials that they're using uh, for, for running on the equipment. What's oftentimes missing, and we talk about variability here is, is the equipment variability because of the inputs received or not received by the pharma company, as an example. What are the limits and tolerances on said product and material? All right, we can use any indicator. It could be flow rate, it could be uh, tensile strength on materials, et cetera, or dimensional, ge 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 geometrical tolerancing on, on physical products. That if we don't get that to the OEM in a timely manner, then they're gonna design around certain specifications that they think are industry standard. And hence, when you go to an FAT, you get uh, abnormalities, which are variabilities where you have stoppages, where you can't open a, a carton correctly in the case, or if it's a vial, you can't get the vial denested and into the system and the equipment because it's out of spec. And that batch of, of that product is out of the specs that we have in our internal system as a pharma company. So we need controls. Remember we talked about specifications, standards, and procedures. Those have got to be understood from us as a pharma company to the OEM. And the OEM needs to say, yeah, this is within spec. And we were able to run this at a agreed efficiency. This is something really, really important. I want to mention that if the people that represent the customer, in, you know, with the OEM or the company that will execute the FIT, um, they need to play an important role to provide the clear information to the OEM. They can assume that the OEM understand their process. Sometimes they send, uh, companies send to the OEM samples, drawings, but they forget to provide the correct information about the assembling of graphics, orientation, you know? And not always the OEM will understand that from the first time. So it's important also more, you know, what Robert said, but 
people that represent the company that will execute the FIT need to be clear about orientation and placement of the component in the package. Because, you know, sometimes most of the failure happen on that communication, Robert. Oh yeah, for sure. Roberto, I think you're spot on. It's assumptions. The key word is assuming. assuming. Uh, and, and we're going to talk later about, you know, this fast paced uh, cycle we're in now mm -hmm. to produce faster, quicker. And that just further exacerbates the need for, first, let's take a step back. We need to debrief and say, what do we have in our toolbox? What standards and procedures do we have? Does it meet the industry requirement? Does it meet what the supplier needs? So that needs to happen first on in the process. And I think we bypass that gate by assuming we have it. And we find out as we go into an FAT, wow, why are we having these stoppages? It's because that product is on the high end of its tolerance. Yeah. All right. So, so, so we need to collaborate with the OEM and the OEM needs to say, yep, yeah, uh, we, we believe we ran this type of product before we've, or we have not. We, we've been close, something similar. But what we're going to need to do in our FAT, we're going to need to uh, accommodate this potential variability as far as time allotted to produce that FAT. So, um, but you, that has to happen continually um, and uh, needs to be part of the specification package that both parties work from. Yes. Let's finish with this topic mentioning the last two items below the best line for variability, which is the standard you know materials specifications and the mood operation let's let's put both together yeah and, and let's mention a little bit about this topic yeah that's interesting so again these four core areas about variability so what we're really essentially saying to those who will watch this podcast is you can have a successful fat or a failed fat because one of four of these one out of the four these of these areas and variability will impact you. So when we talk now about materials, that's it's a no brainer. We've been talking a little bit about that in product is do we document what we're say we're gonna do that we can cast translate that over to external suppliers, yeah? And even our internal de departments and functions that'll be part of the FAT, right? They're gonna come in and they're gonna be executing some activities off this master FAT, sort of a list of things that we're gonna validate and check, right? Mm -hmm. So I think material standards are great. The information needs to be on the drawing. It needs to be documented, right? And it needs to be cascaded in our proposal to the, uh, to the OEM. The, the big piece here is one that is often missed. Um, so what we've been talking about up to now are, are itemized activities, right? Materials, people, standards and procedures. They're categorized, yes? So now you put all these three together and, and equipment, right? So you're gonna have these as a, they, they assemble together to become a, a production line. And that production line has a, a personality and, and it's called modes, modes of operation and engagement that let's just take the pharma company again, that their plan is to run this, this line a certain way. And they have routines of engagement, how they're gonna interact with materials, line stoppages that they induce to perform regulatory guidelines for compliance, yes? So those behaviors are, if they're not documented in the specifications by someone on the team, again, we go back to people, skill level, getting that documented so that it, it's known, then what happens is when you go to an FAT, when you don't have all the equipment buttoned together because the facility can't house all these long conveyors versus each different pieces, assembly pieces of equipment, you, you mimic what can happen in operations, but you don't tactfully or collectively say, this is really how we're going to uh, inter interface with these two pieces of equipment upstream yeah. versus downstream. And what happens is you have um, stoppages, line stoppages, and, and it affects your throughput. So when we get to our uh, further part of this uh, podcast, we'll talk about the industry impact to this. And especially with uh, having to do things quicker, faster, and uh, in, in getting product to market. So I think modes of operations, Wilberto, we could talk a separate podcast on yeah, that. Of course. Because it's, it's a huge deal, but it's a simple deal. And what we need to do is just say, wow, as you said earlier, how do we sit and collaborate and engage the supplier knowledge, our internal team's knowledge, 
on what we plan on doing with this line day to day, shift to shift, so they can design for that, uh, being proactive. So yeah, variability in these four areas to sum it up is very important that we, we, we find baseline and then anything away from baseline, we document it and we test and validate that. Yeah, for me to close this topic, everything that we mentioned here, everything that you just mentioned now, below a standard material specification and mood operation need to be well defined during the scope of work development period. 